So I'm going to be talking some about the links between manual therapy, movement, fascia, and cancer. And some of this will be hypothetical, uh, not encumbered by my own data, but sometimes I'll be uncovered by somebody else's data. And then I have a little of my own data to show you towards the end, trying to bring all these things together. So that uh, works. But Bernard of Chart compared us to puny dwarfs perched on the shoulders of giants. So I'm perched on the shoulders of the giants who've come before me, and others will stand on my shoulders. So what is fascia? Fascia is, uh, a fascia is a sheath or a sheet or number of dissectable aggregations of connective tissue that forms somewhere beneath the skin attaches, encloses, separates muscles and other internal organs. It's one of the largest organs in the body if you call it an organ. Uh, everything in the body is outlined by fascia. The fascial system is a body-wide network of interacting tissues incorporating force transmission, sensory functions, wound regulation, and a number of other things which we are going to discover over the next years. But we need to go back and stand on the shoulders of a giant. Andrew Taylor still called himself an anatomy mechanic in a private clinic in Kirksville, Missouri. He rejected the ineffectual drugs of the day. He opened his osteopathic school, and he published his philosophy of osteopathy. And his body principles are not new to us today, but it's refreshing to see that someone looked at these a long time before. So the, the human body functions as a total unit. The body possesses self-healing and regulatory functions. Structure and function are interrelated. And abnormal pressure in one part of the body produces abnormal pressures and strains in other parts of the body. He was talking about this in the 1800s. Now, now we're looking on a molecular level to say, yes, abnormal pressure on one cell produces pressures and strains down into the nucleus, which goes on to the next cell. And we're seeing exactly what he was talking about. His key concepts where the fascia is a covering, uh, the way we call it constrains our method of understanding it. It produces sliding. It's involved with fluid flow. It is widely innervated. He talked about fascia and respiration. And he talked about fascia and cancer. So fascia covers and penetrates muscles, arterioles, cells, even down into the nucleus. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a good example. So if you look here, this little trough here is a muscle fiber going this way. And you can see the little fibers of the, the, the collagen, which go right into the muscle cell. So the, the collagen fibers that surround the muscle actually penetrate the, the fibers of the cell. And it's all an interconnected network. The clinical implications is that the fascial continuity from the fascial labors to fibrils within the muscle cells. So the forces are transmitted, not just also by, not by tension, but also by shearing, by sliding. The, the cells are right next to each other, and you know when one can't slide, the forces get transmitted by shear. The cells respond to those extracellular forces. The fibers within the cell connect to the fibers outside the cell, and the intracellular structures support both tension and compression. So the cells are not just tensile, but also compressile uh, structures. Like a, they're not just a water balloon. They actually have a whole structure to them. And the question we have is, how do we modify our therapies to take advantage of what we know? So let me, let me take you through that. So here's a good example. Over here on the left is the fascia, the external fascia in a human elbow. Here is the fascia in the neck of the cow. Here is the fascia in the fascia lata of a goat. Uh, here's your garden hose. <laughs> All of those are, the, the, the fibers within the fascia are at the same angle. Well, the garden hose, oh, right, I did it backwards. The garden hose is made, the, the fibers are at a 55 degree angle. This is a structure which is designed to take pressure on the inside, not to get bigger, and to stay flexible. So does that give us a clue as to what might be happening to the fascia lata, which is a covering on the outside of the leg? It needs to take pressure on the inside and stay flexible. 
And so these are the outside fascia. Now it turns out that there are, uh, the orientation of the fibers in the fascia affects how it changes with pressure, stress, compression, and shearing. So from anatomy, you could deduce possible functions. So half of you in the audience have a structure which has fibers going this way. And this structure, when you put pressure in it, gets longer and fatter. Only half of you have it. So again, we can deduce from the architecture what the structure must be. So Yap Wanderval wrote a very important paper based on work he did back in 1988, which is available. And he talks about the architecture of the connective tissue. And let me explain a little why we really need to look at architecture. So what he's saying is that we think of ligaments going between bones and muscles going between bones. But what happens is if you have a ligament between a bone and you move the bones, the ligament at a fixed distance doesn't work because the bones are changing distance. So ligaments can't exist this way. It's not possible. What you have is a ligamentous structure with the muscle going into it, which can then tense that ligament in different portions so that it stays at the right tension across different parts of the body. So that our whole anatomical concept of, if you look at the, the an anatomy of ligaments and muscles, it doesn't work that way. So what he says then is, instead of here where the, the, the muscle gets, the ligament gets loose on one side and too tight on the other, the ligament stays in the right function on both sides of the joint no matter where we go. So this is a very important concept to think of architecture. And you know, we've, we've heard this concept of architecture before. Uh, I'm, now I'm talking about architecture in a larger context. And I don't need him to touch it and that goes on, but that's okay. Okay, so the clinical implications, the, the ligaments and the ligament receptors are anatomic artifacts. What really happens when we're doing manual therapy is we may be creating a better glide between the enveloping septa of the muscle. We may be addressing the mechanical receptors like the Golgi tendon organs at the transition of the muscle tissue to the septa. And we're working with the muscle and the connected tissue as functional units. It's not just isolated parts. It's a whole process that's connected. The fascia terminology. Fascia is named by the organ that it surrounds, and so it, it hides the inherent continuity that the fascia goes from one end of the body to the other end. It changes its name as it crosses different structures, but it's all one layer. The embryologic or origin is in the mesoderm. Fascia has a gliding function. So A.T. Still says fascia gives all muscles help to glide over and around adjacent muscles. So it allows the movement of muscle fascicles. Most of us came here on a wheeled vehicle, and when that car went around the corner, one wheel had to turn faster than the other. When I move my arm, some of the muscle fibers have to stretch more than others because they've got to go a bigger distance around the elbow than others do. So the muscle fibers are always sliding back and forth on each other. They need to slide. On the other hand, when I want to lift something up heavy, I want them all to stick together. I want them to work together. So any of you who've done cross-country skiing and you've used the wax, if you get the right wax, you push your foot down, it sticks, you slide forward, it glides. If you get the wrong wax, you don't get either kick or glide. But if you get the right wax, it works really nicely. Our muscles, again, it's the same thing. If you get the right combination of lubricant in there, they work very well. So some of the fascial observations during surgery by Jean-Claude Gamberteau, and you can see the little, the nice little tendrils of, of fascia going up, and here is a muscle, uh, here's a tendon, and you can see the fascia surrounding it. Now tendons aren't just ropes in a tube, but the tendon sheath is actually connected to the tendon with special structures that allow it to stretch so that connection can stay there, but that it can stretch back and forth kind of like the the, the gasoline pump and the, the rope on the gasoline pump. Fascia and fluid flow. We've talked a little bit about fluid flow a little earlier. So here, here's a, a concept that takes a little while to understand. When we hit ourselves and we get an inflammation, the tissue swells up. In other words, 
fluid collects in the extracellular tissue. And the fluid flow across the capillary can increase by about 100-fold. So it, it really can build up very quickly. The, those, you know, when we bump ourselves, we can get a bump really fast. What I didn't understand until Rolf Reed came to the Fascia Congress in 2012 is that the extracellular matrix is like a sponge and it's wrapped with connective tissue. When you take a sponge and you wrap it with string, it can't absorb water. When that string relaxes, the sponge absorbs water. So the extracellular matrix is hyperosmolic. It wants to absorb water, but it can't. The moment the collagen relaxes, it sucks water. So what happens is, during inflammation, water is actually literally pulled out of the capillary by the extracellular matrix. It doesn't just leak out, it's actually pulled out. So there's a very active function of the extracellular matrix in transmission of fluid. We have a lot of fluid in our extracellular matrix, and about seven and a half liters a day move through the extracellular matrix. That's a lot of fluid that's flowing. And you know, we only have a four and a half liters of blood, so a lot of fluid is going through the, the extracellular matrix. Half of it makes it to the lymph nodes and back into the vena cava. The other half actually gets absorbed even before it even gets to the vena cava. So there's a, a massive amount of fluid moving around in the body. Fascia innervation. If you look at the, the analysis of nerves, there are about six times as many nerves to the fascia as to the muscle spindle. Now we think muscles are important. We need a muscle spindle to control where we're going, but hold it. We've got a lot more nerves to fascia than we do to muscle spindles. So the muscle spindles happen to be in areas where there's forced transmission from the muscle to the fascia outside the muscle. So the fascia really is a sensory organ. Uh, nerves conduct at the most 50 meters per second. When you mechanically push on fascia, that mechanical signal is, is sound. It's a sound wave. It goes at 1,500 meters per second. So that it's not a very precise localization, but information can move very quickly, mechanically, in fascia. A.T. still talked a little bit about fascia and cancer. And that's what led me to all of this. I only got to reading A.T. Still's work in about 2011, and I go, oh. And that's when I started talking to Len, saying, we should talk about fascia and cancer. And that was sort of the, the genesis of this. So, what are the links? And I'm, I'll take you through this, and then I'll, I'll go back in, in, in detail. So grip strength is associated with increased survival. Resistance training decreases cancer mortality. Diseases of stiffening, like scleroderma and dermatomyositis, have an increase in cancer. And you've heard the matrix is stiffening as part of the metastatic growth. Exercise can reduce tissue stiffness systematically. When you exercise, 30 to 50% of the forces go laterally. And they're not going down the tendon. They're going outside the muscle to other structures. When the muscle contracts, it's going to shorten and it's going to expand. So in the process of muscle contraction, it's putting forces laterally out through the other tissues. And I'll show you some data on this. Resistance training in a particular way with the muscle being short doesn't stiffen the tension. But in another way, it does stiffen the tension the, the, in, in the tendon. So we know that the specificity of training is well known for sports. If you want to be a badminton player, you train one way. If you want to be a weightlifter, you train another way. We don't know what is the specificity of training of exercise for cancer. And I'm going to suggest that squats and presses and lunges are not the best exercise for cancer. And I'll show you what I think is. So, when you look at the design of, of exercises, there's an inconsistency in the way the literature reports how exercise affects, in this case, I'm, I'm looking at fatigue in prostate cancer. And so when you exercise in one particular way, fatigue drops by 10% uh, if one of the eight exercises are, are with the muscle in the short position. And if 40% of the, uh, if four of the short exercises are, are excuse me, four of the six exercises in their program are in the short position, fatigue decreases by 40%. So fatigue changes depending on how you do the exercise. Well, let me take you through all that. I'm giving you a broad brush, but you know, I went too fast for you to understand, but at least you know where we're going. So what do we need to know about manual therapy and cancer? 
Is it harmful? Is it safe? Is it helpful? Is it harmful? We need to understand the physiology. We need to know cell dimensions, cell morphology, growth rate, location, location, location. So sentinel node lymph biopsy. So they do a pre-biopsy of breast massage. They inject some things that are going to go down the lymph that they can see later, and they massage the breast. The question is, there's cancer in there. Are they making it worse? Well, cancer cells are big. The uh, image that they're putting in, the molecules they put in to image are small, so they're going to diffuse much faster. So when they actually go in and do the biopsy, the cancer cells probably haven't gotten there anyway. When they, look the, when they do the, the biopsy in the lymph node, it's positive the cluster size is greater than 0.2 millimeters. Well, that's 1,000 tumor cells. That tumor, if one cell got moved, it would have had to double 10 times to get to be a size that would be positive. And is a tumor cell going to double 10 times between when they do the breast massage and when they do the lymph node? No. Tumor cells also have larger nuclei than normal size tissue. And when they look at and they see the epithelial cells from the breast in the lymph node, they've got the normal. They don't have the abnormal size. So they've pretty much concluded, no, massage on a cancerous breast does not transmit cancer cells to the lymph nodes. And that's about as direct as a massage as you can get. What we also know is that metastases rarely go to muscle. In lung cancer, about 2.5% on their initial staging will have metastases in their, in their muscles. So that's the highest amount you're going to find. And if you look at reported muscle metastases, 25% are from lung cancer, 8% are from stomach, renal, and breast, 1% are from prostate. Now, there's about the same number of people with lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. But there's 25 times more muscle metastases from prostate cancer, from, from, muscle, from lung, than from prostate. So if you have a patient with prostate, that, that person does not have a muscle metastasis. You can put your hands wherever you want. There's not going to be a muscle met, met there. For lung, it's a little bit of a problem. Now, for stomach, there's 10 times more people with lung cancer than stomach cancer. So if 2.5% of lung cancer have METs, you're probably talking 7 or 8% of people with stomach cancer do have muscle metastasis. So it depends on the muscle where you're going. Look at location. 70% of the metastases from breast cancer are in the extraocular muscles. Those are tiny little muscles in the eye. Now, how much fluid, how much blood flow from metastases is possible in the extratocular muscles? It's not very much. So, and 15% and of overall muscle metastases are in the eye. We'll get back to that. Why do I think, you know, the eye muscles might be particularly sensitive? So, we talked a little bit earlier in one of the lectures about osteosarcoma and manipulating the tumor. Does it make it spread? So, I went back to the data here. So these patients came in, some had manipulative therapy, some did not prior to their seeing a physician and getting diagnosed. The number of manipulative therapy in weeks was generally, you know, one to three weeks, and they had one to three treatments. Well, if I massage an osteosarcoma and I push something loose and it goes to the lungs, and it grows, how long does it take to get to a size that I can find? Well, let's do some calculations. An osteoblast, here's the size. If a metastasis, let's say you, you get really good imaging and you can pick up one that's half a, half a millimeter. Now, generally, they talk about half a centimeter as a metastasis, but let's say it's half a millimeter. So that's 31,000 cells. That means that tumor cell had to double 15 times to get there to be that size. If I'm poking on an osteosarcoma and three weeks later there's a tumor that's doubled 15 times, that's, it's, they don't grow that fast. I mean, yes, they grow in five days. They might, if they're very aggressive, they might double in five days. But they don't grow, they don't double 15 times in, in three weeks. It doesn't happen. So again, it's, it's just, it's more likely that 
the patients with a very rapid growing tumor that had already metastasized were probably more painful and probably had some direct therapy. So those patients are different than the ones who didn't have the, the therapy. So yes, if you poke on a tumor, you know, three times, three times a day for 15 weeks, yes, you'll knock something loose. But no, if you poke on it a few times, you probably won't. So again, the, the chances are that manual therapy, generally speaking, you know, is not going to be a problem with spreading, spreading cancer tissues. At least that's from my reading of the literature. The question now is, manual therapy safe? Breast and, and prostate frequently go to bone. Patients do have bone metastases. Can we do things in people with bone metastases? So resistance training, in this case in breast, whoop, back up. And patients with breast and prostate cancer, increase in muscle strength and in quality of life. Even isometric training of people with paraspinal muscles, they have spinal metastases. And they're strengthening the paraspinal muscles. And you get decreased pain, decreased use of opioids. So if you have a, a metastasis in a muscle and you make a sudden movement and you grab something, you're going to put a big load on the muscle. It's like if your car hits a brick wall, it's going to be compressed quite a bit and you really need to have your seatbelt and your airbag. If, on the other hand, you are very slowly and consciously exercising, you are not doing an impact loading on the bone. You are strengthening the muscles around the bone without impact loading. So if you think about where is the metastasis and how do I avoid putting a large load in a short period of time, and in this case, it's safe. You can actually exercise people with bony metastases. But you need to think about how you do it. But again, there's some published studies, not very many, where they were willing to do it, and it turns out to be safe. So is manual therapy helpful? Muscle strength, tissue stiffness, and inflammation. So grip strength, uh, again, it corresponds to uh, if you are strong, if you're in the lowest third, you're less likely to die from heart attack, stroke, cancer, um, a number of things. If you look here at pre-diagnosis physical activity and cancer mortality, if your pre-diagnosis is about, you know, it's about 10, 10 to 15 mets per week, that's three hours of vigorous walking or one hour of really vigorous cross-country skiing, you are less likely to die if you develop cancer. Muscle is important. If you do resistance exercise after you're diagnosed, your mortality is less. Mortality is up here if you're exercising here if you're not. So we know tissue stiffness, scleroderma and dermatosias, have two to six-fold increase in cancer. Um, and what we find is that if you look here, sometimes the cancer comes first, sometimes the dermatomyositis comes first, but they both come about the same period of time. In other words, it's a process that's the tissue stiffness gives you a tissue disease and gives you cancer simultaneously. And this is about 70% of the people with scleroderma have an associated cancer, pretty high. Exercise affects tissue stiffness. So DeLorme developed a progressive resistive exercise program uh, back in the 1940s. And what he noticed was that fibrotic limbs softened, range of motion increased, and even skin scars softened the way he was doing exercise. There's some data that show that a rat tail tendon will soften when you put the rats on aerobic exercise. And there's data that shows if you exercise one way, your tendons get stiffer. You exercise another way, the tendons don't. So again, if you do high resistance, the tendons get stiffer. If you do lower resistance at about 60% of maximum, the tendons do not get stiffer. So my, again, I'm saying don't exercise quite so hard. Don't try to be an Olympic weightlifter, and you won't make your tendons stiffer. And stiffer, less stiff may be good. So just a, DeLorme basically used weights and pulleys uh, for men who were in the hospital. And it's based on a 10 repetition maximum. You may have heard of progressive resistive exercise. 10 repetitions at half the weight, 10 at 3 quarters of the weight, then 10 at 100% of the weight. 
What everybody misses is in his first 1945 paper, which is that the muscle is loaded when it's short. So that if I take a triceps and I load it, and I straighten out this way, when the triceps is short, my arm is straight and it's not, it does not have to work very hard. This way, the triceps has to work hard when it's shorter. And all of Delorme's exercises are done with the muscle shorter. What he noted is that the muscle is not as strong when it's short. You can't lift as heavy a weight, so you can fatigue it with less weights and pulleys. So it's easier to fatigue him that way. And it turns out it seems to soften the tissues as well. So when the muscle is contracting, forces are going laterally. If you actually measure the force proximally and distal in the tendon, there can be a 30 to 50% difference. The forces go out sideways to other muscles. So as you are exercising, forces are going throughout the whole connective tissue fascial matrix in the body. Just again, the diagram of the the muscle and you've got fascia around a little muscle fiber, you've got a bundle of fibers surrounded and then the whole muscle itself is surrounded by a larger fascia. And again, we talked a little bit about the angle and different parts of the, the tissue have different angle. The paramyzium, the middle layer, actually has this 55 degrees. And if you look at short versus long exercise, so these are quadriceps muscle that is exercised either with the quadriceps in the short position or the long position, you can see that there is indeed a change in IGF-1, depending on you know, how you exercise the muscle. But I'm going to focus a little more on something else. So we developed a mathematical model of forces showing that when you exercise with the muscle short, pressure goes laterally. That can be sometimes almost as much as 50% of the longitudinal stress. TGF beta measured in 11 healthy males after eight weeks of short or long training. We did ultrasound measurement of the biceps muscle. And finally, we have a, a single case study of a man with prostate cancer on androgen deprivation uh, switched to exclusively short length exercises. And what do we find? So here, the muscle at rest, when it contracts, it gets shorter and it has to get fatter. And so the forces going out this way are about 50% of the forces coming this way. That's pretty substantial. I mean, muscles are pretty strong. So you're talking quite a lot of force going laterally outside the muscle. We looked at ultrasound, and you can actually measure the, the tissue thickness here, and you can measure where the tendon junction is. And we did a biceps contraction in a short length versus a long length. And what we found is that the short length, when, as the muscle contract it, it gets thicker. With the long length exercise, as the muscle contracts, it doesn't change. So again, as, as our theory predicts, the muscle is getting thicker when you contract it in the short length position. For the knee extension, you can exercise patients here in the quadriceps is in the, is in the long length, or you can exercise here where the quadriceps is in the short length. And what you find, if you look at the, the TGF beta, now you've heard TGF beta, TGF beta may not be a good thing for cancer. So what happens here is if you do the, the group averages and you do the contraction in the short length, TGF beta is going down during the training and it continues to decrease after the training is over. Whereas TGF beta in the long length isn't changing much. But I can show you some individual data here. If you look at the individual males in the short length and the long length. You see in the short length, the TGF beta is going down. In the long length, it tends to go up. And this is a p-value of 0.055. It doesn't quite reach the 0.05 significance, but it's only an n of 11. So it's a pretty substantial change in TGF beta, depending on how you're doing the exercise. You're doing it at the short length versus the long length. So short length, quadriceps extension short length, press long length. You're working very hard, and here when the muscle is short, you don't have to work very hard because your bones are taking it. <coughs> so if you go to a gym, there's lots of ways you can do a triceps exercise. This is short length. All these others are long length. So most of the exercises in a gym will be long length exercises. Possible mechanisms. Muscle can make testosterone from DHEA. There are various pathways there. The TGF beta is actually released by a mechanical stretch of the extracellular matrix. 
Um, and there's a number of other potential mechanisms. But the important thing is that when the, the single case uh, changed exercise from a mixture of short and long length, the typical gym exercises, to exclusively the, the short length by Delorme, fatigue dropped by 80 percent. Huge drop in fatigue. And we don't have a lot of good ways to deal with fatigue. So that's my project now is testing um, muscle strength uh, exercise. So there's a, a lot of other, other possible things, but um, again, we talked a little bit about metastases going to muscle. The extracellular, the extraocular muscles are the only ones that don't have to work very hard. It's not very hard to move an eyeball. Those muscles never pull very hard. Now, what we do know is that tumor metastasis is very rare in striated muscle. Muscle makes a uh, very low molecular weight that actually kills muscle. But more importantly, what happens when you inject tumor cells into the myocardium, they die. Muscle actively kills metastatic cells. So not only is it not a good place, it's actually a good place to filter out. If you inject cells into a quadriceps and the muscle is denervated, it reduces the filtering. If you inject them into the quadriceps and you stimulate it, it, it increases the killing by a great deal. So exercise during chemotherapy for breast cancer seems to help. So again, what are the links? I've gone through this, but I want to thank many, many people who contributed their time, knowledge, and money. The NIH conference grant for the first fascia congress the Gagarin Trust and the Massage Therapy Foundation, which have continued their support over the years, and Robert Schleip here in the audience, who triggered all of this 10 years ago when he came to visit me in New Jersey. So thank you very much.